I thought I am mic'd up. I, I, feel, I feel I have to shout because you're sitting so far away. Um, um, I'm going to talk about circulation. I'm going to stick to the brief a little bit. Um, circulation through um, space and time relating to, to, to Folkestone and, and some of the things we've, we've talked about already. So next slide. Next slide. We're going to be looking at six different things. In the beginning, uh, change. I want to talk about a theory of change. I want to talk about the topography of, of Folkestone and how we flow through it. How that topography has been inhabited. How we circulate through that, that urban environment overlaid on the topography of Folkestone. And last, I want to go back to the point that was made earlier about w walking and seeing. And uh, uh, a very powerful way of, a pr of uh, trying to get a grip on a town. So let's go to the next slide. And in the beginning, next one. In the middle of the 17th century, uh, Arch Archbishop, Arch oh, oh, that's good. Lights. Well, in oh, hello. Yeah, uh, Archbishop Usher published a, f um, a famous book, um, uh, Analum Pars Posteria, published in 1654. And he charged himself with the idea of saying, well, when did creation take place? And he consulted the only, only uh, authority he had, which, of course, was the, uh, the, the Bible. And he uh, totted up all the dates of all the things he could find in the Bible and when was the great flood and what have you. And he concluded that creation took place at the entrance of the night preceding the 23rd day of October on the year before Christ, 4004, uh, 4, which is pleasingly precise. It was probably a Tuesday. Um, uh, uh, in other words, it was, it was about six o'clock on the day before. That's when God said, let there be light. Um, the current estimate of the Earth's age is about four and a half billion years old. But God said, let there be light to create the universe about 14 billion years ago. And light started about 300 years uh, after that. So we're living in a very old environment. We inhabit, we circulate through something very ancient. Next slide. So change. Next slide. This little chalkboard diagram, I think, is very important. I use it a lot to talk to my students. It's about the idea of the relationship between the ephemeral city, the city of change, the city which consists of events, that it consists of events, of props, of exhibits, of installations, of temporary structures, all the things you're doing a lot of here in, in Folkestone, compared with the material city of architecture, public space, monuments, infrastructure, and the topography. The theory of change I want to talk to you about, uh, that, that really is the core of this talk, is the idea that each of these things change at a different rate. Each of these different layers is a bit like looking inside an old-fashioned watch. There's a whole series of cogs which sort of fit together. Some move very slowly, some move very quickly. And the ephemeral moves qu quite quickly and topography moves rather slowly. And the problem arises if topography starts accelerating, if it starts changing too quickly, if you have an earthquake, if we have global warming, if we have big environmental change, suddenly if that dial in the watch starts accelerating, all the rest of it falls over. Architects have this rather bizarre notion, and town planners even more, the, the material city is what leads, leads, uh, leads change. And the thing I keep telling my students is, well, it may be a bit disappointing, but you're not that important. Actually, what really changes the city is the ephemeral, the economy, how things flow through the economy, how people thro flow through uh, the city, how people work in the city, what people do is what drives uh, a city. And it's great to see here in Folkestone that that idea seems to be taken on board and that most of the changes so far have been about the ephemeral city as a model for trying to decide what to do about architecture and public space and what have you. But it doesn't start with the uh, material. 
We're going to go on now, and we're going to start from the topographical aspect of Folkestone. And we're going to work our way down, uh, going from uh, r uh, right to left, rather than left to right, uh, 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 during the talk. So, next slide. So let's look at topography. Here we have the, uh, the, the, the famous chalk cliffs of, uh, of, of Folkestone. Formed something like uh, uh, 70 to 100 million years ago. Layers and layers and layers and layers of the ocean uh, uh, building up. Very, very slowly. It appears not to be changing in our lifetimes. In fact, it's changing all the time. Next slide. Because if we, if we look in, into rather deeper change, uh, 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 um, the UK, of course, was connected to uh, the, the, the continent of Europe all during, uh, for a very, very long, long period. And, uh, it, and it was only during uh, one or two disasters which, which um, were rising sea levels and what have you, which separated the two. So next slide. So here we are, about 450,000 years ago, um, the great uh, lake, number two on that diagram, broke through and cleared the, cleared the way between Britain and France to make the, uh, attempt to make what is the English Channel and separate the, the, the two uh, continental Europe from, 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 from Britain. And those cliffs that we see are the remnants of that, of that, that big event. There was another event ab about uh, eight and a half thousand years ago where uh, a landslip just off Norway caused about a 10 meter standing wave to come blasting down the North Sea and wipe out Doggerland. So those are, those are, the, those are the, the, the big changes, but they took place in a, over a very long period of time. And so we have the, the, the separate uh, 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 UK and the constant, continent of Europe separate one from another. Next slide. And this is what it looks like now, because that, that um, geology that was laid down over, over hundreds of millions of years has been eroded away. And we can see here the cross-section between the South Downs, the Chalk, uh, and, and the North Downs. And it's a, kind of like, like a dome that's been, where the top's been uh, eroded away. Next slide. That's the, that's the geology of folks. But the next slide probably explains this better. Uh, so you get the contours. It's the edge. It's the edge of one of those uh, one of those uh, uh, geological uh, formations. Next slide. And here we see, here we see the the actual uh, diagram uh, of that, that that dome of different layers of geology chopped off across the t across the top. So we get the chalk coming around uh, past over in the green. Then we get gulk clay and then wheel sand. And that goes all the way across, and it appears more or less the same thing over in on France, France on the other side. And what happens is that in, um, water falling on the chalk permeates down through, and then percolates up again through the gork clay, and forms the origin of the various rivers, which have carved the land that makes Folkestone. Next one. In cross-section, this is the way it looks uh, going underneath the, uh, the sea. You can see the geology on the United Kingdom side and on the French side is more or less exactly the same. And that green layer, the, the, the chalk marl, is a very, very good for tunneling. And of course, it's exactly through there that they managed to thread through the channel tunnel. Through that layer. Worked out in the 19th century, bizarrely enough. Next slide. Uh, where, where they built this remarkable machine, Beaumont's boring machine, and next slide. And they, they worked out how to build this, through that layer, build a tunnel between here and France. And that time, at that time, uh, the idea was that it was going to be horse-drawn. And of course, the horses need a bit of a rest uh, after pulling halfway across the channel. So they were going to build an island in the middle for all the stables to change the horses. And the people could get out of the carriage, have a nice little walk around in this little island they were going to build, uh, change the horses, put them on, and tow you through to uh, France on the other side. They started building it, amazingly enough. And some of you may well have seen the, uh, uh, the, the entrance to, to that, that tunnel. But uh, 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 they the kind of um, timidity struck, I think, and, the, and, the, and they didn't do it. But this idea of, of circulating through that geology by drawing a, drilling a hole 
goes all the way back to, to, to the 19th century. Next slide. So there we are. This is what it looks like in, inside there, where they started. Uh, they got some way through, but um, uh, discretion was the better part of valor, I think. Next slide. So we've got a piece of geology with its contours, with its flowing rivers, and humankind has inhabited it for uh, a very long time. The pre-history. Pre Here is that, that river coming out of coming out of coming out of the, the edge of the chalk, flowing down, cutting away down to the river, uh, cutting cutting away down to finding its way down to the sea and carving the the Pent River carving that way down, down to the sea, which provides a rather unusual thing. If you follow the river down, you get a connection between inland and the sea. Next slide. The, uh, the cartoon on the left, um, oops, you go back in. Uh, no, no, back again. Back, back. Next slide. We seem to be going backwards. Next slide. Okay, we'll stick with this one. Uh, so, so you can see on the, on the, uh, the, the first early inhabitation is, is either side of that river, taking, taking advantage of this, uh, this advantageous uh, gap between the inland uh, and, and the sea where we can get down to, uh, to the coast. You know, so the, the contours have been laid down in a very ancient way. The river's been there forever and we're the, gradually inhabiting it in a series of layers. So we'll just go through those one at, one at a time. Next. So we uh, add defenses, uh, defenses, next one. And we get uh, trade and growth, 1815, 1843, the beginnings of a town uh, uh, accreting itself around, around the, the, uh, the advantageous route through uh, to the sea. Uh, next one. And at this point here, here we get around about the middle of the, middle of the 19th century, um, taming of nature. What, we mean, what do we mean by that? Taming the tides with the harbour walls. The, the beginning of uh, taming movement by the introduction of, of railway viaducts and the big viaduct crossing over the, the centre of the valley there. And the, and the town growing up around those, uh, those, those connections. Some new waterways being brought in as, as well. Next one. And then booms, the whole thing booms. The, you know, the resorts, 1850s and 1914, the eastward uh, growth, growth of uh, Folkestone, the west, westward growth, uh, the westward, eastward, and northern growth, breaking out through this big, big wall that had been built by the railway line uh, to, to the north. Next one, and then uh, uh, a certain amount of infilling. Next one, and then we get a period of decline after the, after the around about the 1960s, where uh, the economy moves somewhere else. The ephemeral economy, the way in which we move capital through the thing, moves somewhere else, and suddenly you get decline in the very heart of the place. Folks, is quite unusual in that regard. It has a wealthier exter exterior than it has. The center, the center, normally the wealthiest part of most towns, is is, is rather rather poor and um, uh, and run down. And next thing, next slide. And so the idea at the moment that, that you seem to be pursuing, which with great enthusiasm, and this building is part of it, is the idea of how do we regenerate the center of the town, the original piece of the town, the reason why the place is here at all, because that's how people got down to to the ocean. Uh, how do we regenerate it? And the idea here, uh, the, the idea seems to be that it's through the ephemeral arts. That's what will attract people, that will attract ideas, that will attract new industry, that will attract inventive people who can make something out of nothing, which is basically what art is, making something from nothing. A bit of old paint, something unbelievable. Something has been made from nothing. Um, and going back to my, set, my earlier slide, the material and the ephemeral, that's exactly the right way to do it. If you read people like Jane Jacobs, um, uh, The Economy of Cities and, and things like that, um, she rather debunks the idea that cities were founded because of the agricultural revolution. 
which gave, gave rise to a surplus of people who could then come in and inhabit towns. She said, no, no, it wasn't like that at all. What started cities was people gathering for ephemeral events, big parties, gathering of nomadic people to have a big party. The Reading Festival is a better model for the start of cities than is the idea of the agricultural revolution. In fact, she argues that agriculture was invented in cities, but that's another long story. Um, we have fragments of them, don't we? Do we not? Stonehenge, Avebury. These are remnants of ancient gatherings, the real origins of cities. So we have a, 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 the correct application of an ephemeral approach to um, a, a renewing uh, uh, a city with, with potentially some... This, this is uh, John Leatherland's scheme for... Uh, the waterside, uh, the, the beach, beachside regeneration, uh, which of course has now been su superseded by, by other ideas. But um, um, fine plan by John Leatherman, but we should give him a credit, uh, even though he's not here. But well done, John Leatherman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next one, please. So here we have, here is Folkestone, as we can see. That amazing pattern that you can see there, that amazing pattern, extraordinary pattern. Uh, which Terry Farrell, my old boss, and uh, John, uh, John Leatherland's old boss, said, this is the greatest work of humankind, that pattern, because it's created by everybody. It's not a work of art or a painting or a work of art or a, con a concerto with an author. It's the sum total of all our efforts all working together over a very, very long uh, pe period of time. And it has its own beauty and its own meaning and what have you. So next slide. We're now going to look at um, um, the, the figure. Our next one. Oh, hang on. Um, go back one. Okay, so, th so that's, that's the pattern as a figure ground. We're now going to look at um, how that's been in inhabited. So next one. The green spaces taking up the, the, the steep contours on, on the edges, some of the sort of gap sides. Next one the overlay of the contours, and you can see that, that how the, the green and the contours kind of goes together as a, as a, as a pattern. Next one. Uh, the gap sites, which are uh, slightly random, uh, and, it, and it's part of the, tr the, the attempt to adapt the city to th this thing which had grown up without cars, it was a, you know, horses and carts and, w and walking pattern, has been, been infilled by uh, uh, cars and, you know, right at the centre there, um, well, you probably can't see it, but uh, uh, right at the centre of the, the, near the Harbour Arm, you know, a great big car park right in the middle of perhaps what should be a, um, a, a beautiful place. Next one. There's all sorts of blockages being, uh, within that urban pattern brought, brought about by uh, the design of streets, uh, uh, dead ends, cul-de-sacs and what have you, which sort of block block up the, 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 the free flow of people through the place. Uh, coming back to the analogy about um, the, 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 fl the flow, of, flow of blood through the body, perhaps, perhaps these are places where there are sort of uh, heart attacks taking place in the, uh, in, in the urban, urban pattern. Next one. And these two lines of uh, what we're talking about, you know, the, the, the poorer parts of town, right, right in the middle of the uh, urban pattern. Next one. And then the creative quarter, right in the centre, helping us to uh, the, the start of an ephemeral regeneration of um, the town. You now, coming back to that theory of change I talked about in the beginning. Next one. And then uh, the plan of plans, you know, where, where the, again, another round of applause for John Leatherland and his plan for uh, the, the waterfront of, uh, of Folkestone. Next slide. So circulation, let's just look qu quickly at that. Same pattern, uh, the cycle routes obviously coming along the, 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 the flat part at the front, you know, a response to 100 million years of, uh, uh, 100 million years of evolution of this landscape. Next one, the blockages we talked about, the railway comes in and um, um, the railway comes in and, and makes these very fast connections long distance. But what it does locally is creates severance. And that's one of, the, one of the sort of iron laws, I think, of urbanism is that the better you can connect at the distance, the greater the severance you create across, across the route. You think of motorways, you think of railway lines, you think of 
any fast flowing uh, route for traffic. As soon as you try and accelerate the traffic, improve the connectivity long distance, the greater the, the, the severance across it. Terribly bad for urbanism to have high speed uh, uh, traffic coming through the middle of it. Ad advantageous though it is if you want to get long distance. It's an iron law, apparently, of, uh, of, of urbanism. And we could perhaps have a debate with the, the traffic engineers amongst you about, about that topic. Uh, are there any traffic engineers there? It doesn't matter. Um, so some, some blockages. Uh, the, the, the old harbour arm, extraordinary piece of uh, railway uh, engineering, but it does absolutely chop off. There's only those three, uh, th three or four connections underneath it, across it, uh, t to link uh, eastern Folkestone to western Folkestone. Next one. And then, this bizarre thing, um, which is the, the uh, I'm not sure if any of these have been undone since this diagram was done, but uh, this is the desperate attempt of um, traffic engineers and planners to adapt a, an urban pattern that's evolved over a very long time to, to the car. And of course the roads are too narrow, so, well, that's no good for a car. You know, put, apply the standard, therefore the cars have to go in, in one direction. What it does, it accelerates the traffic, breaks the iron law about uh, crossing the road, uh, and, and creates, uh, well, visual and uh, activity havoc. It, it, if I rule the world and I don't, and that's probably a good thing, you know, do away with them all. And it would just calm everything down in the town and perhaps uh, help with the regeneration efforts which you know uh, the, the good people of Folkestone and the creative quarter are try trying to do. Completely bizarre circulation. The, the amount of distance you have to drive around to get from A to B is, 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 is completely mad. Makes it very dangerous for, for pedestrians and what have you. So the circulation of people on foot by bicycle, by, uh, by animal and by foot by muscle that made this town is not a, not a place for uh, high-speed wheel traffic like this. And trying to adapt it, trying to force it to be that, uh, is, is very, very destructive. There, there are other, other uh, um, crazy highway proposals in, in Folkestone as well. But, but it seems to me that uh, you're starting in the middle. Perhaps that's the place for us to look. Next one. And then the overlay of all of them together, and you can you can you can uh, see what a kind of crazy uh, circulation system we've we've ended up with. Next slide. So, 2017, um, we got together with uh, actually some of you have got some familiar faces. I think some of you must have come on some of those walks. Possibly, possibly not. Um, we had, the, had this idea to take that idea, that reading of the topography of Folkestone, and we set up uh, five walks over five, uh, sat five Saturdays uh, th that we did it. Uh, we started one along the Lees, two, three, four, uh, and, five, and the end, last one, five, uh, uh, walking into the city centre. And the idea of that was, let's get rid of the car, let's get rid of all of that. Let's just walk and look and talk and see what we can see. And the, uh, what was nice about it was that uh, quite a lot of the people who came along were uh, Folkestone people. Uh, and they said, oh, do you know, I've never, never, never really looked at the place. In that. Did you, I've, never, I've never seen that before, you know. Never looked, uh, actively looking, that, that was the idea, as a method for thinking about the town, thinking about where you live, thinking about what you might do. Very powerful. It, at the end of it, we would say, wouldn't it be great to get the town planning and the the councillors, and actually just to march them round, you know, saying, well, what do you think of that? And what do you think of that? And what, what do you think of this? Uh, is this right? You know, th that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, five walks. Next slide. I just want to look at one of them because it is, you know, we haven't got time to go through, through all of them. So we're going to look at route number four, which was down from the, from the East Lees. And I'll just, uh, it's a snapshot of, you know, some of the pages from the report that we produced at, at the end of it. And ne next one. So here we all are. Uh, I'm just trying to match a few faces up here. Uh, yes. Uh, 
I don't know what we were, I can't remember what we were all looking at, but we were all sort of, something was uh, flying past at, the, at a high level. These were all the walkers uh, at the beginning of it, and we set off uh, fr from, the, uh, from the high point uh, uh, in the east and walked towards the center. So this is it. Next. Uh, at the end of it, everybody was invited to produce a drawing of their thoughts and to record uh, so, some of their, their ideas. And everybody produced very, very beautiful drawings, which we've, we've kept and you know, we, 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 we've recorded. Again, a very powerful way. Just get down, what did you see? Um, what, would you, what would you like to see change? A lot of people did mind maps, other people did lists, other people read essays. Some people are rather arty, did some rather arty things. Um, uh, really, really uh, a terrific output. Next slide. And there we are, marching down, uh, looking at some land and looking at uh, signs for no camping. Well, why no camping? Why, why, what's that all about? Why, why, why are we doing that? And then discovering, next slide, uh, discovering, dis you know, people, people on the walk say, well, of course, this is a Roman site. This is, this, this is, and we discovered then later on some, some of the archaeological uh, sites uh, of, of the, great, the great villa up there on the, on the, on the, east, uh, the east, east Lees. Uh, next slide. We looked at suburbia in a rather, rather sort of generous and uh, loving way. Because again, it looks very fixed. But actually, if you look very closely, it's gradually changing. Gradually, gradually gardening. A window gets changed. A little dormer gets added. Um, a solar panel gets added in. A wall gets knocked down. Somebody adapts something for the car. We got some, some next slide. So you get beautiful things like this. Um, and I think I think this is. A, forgive me if this happens to be your house, because um, that that would be, turn out. Wouldn't it? But what an extraordinary work of uh, of art. You know, the, the 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 art of clipping that tree. That took some doing. You know, that's not an accidental work. Uh, the, 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 the way in which th some of the windows have been changed, some of them haven't been, the little dorm that's been added, this is, this, is ad this is gradual accretion. It's that same slow change that, that, we, uh, that, that, that I'm talking about. It's akin to the, to the geological speed of change, but maybe a little bit faster. Adaptation of architecture. Next one. And then you get ones like the one on the left. Again, if, apologies if this is your house. Um, where the amount of extensions has kind of subsumed the original house. Um, th th there's more extension than there is an original house, which, which I think it results in a, in a rather glorious piece of architecture. I have shown this at a couple, of a couple of architectural conferences, and people have been up in arms, you know, how did that get planning permission? For God's sake, what are we doing? Uh, I said, well, you know, this is... This is those people, whoever they are, this is these people adapting their house to their uh, evolving need. What's wrong with that? Why should we worry? Why should we bother about it? The one on the right, um, satellite dishes, technology changes, adaptation to needs. I find it very beautiful. And I think we should be less worried about it in town planning terms. Ne next one. The railway line, what a project. When are we going to do it? When are we going to, and what are we going to use it for? 19th century, at incredible expense, with incredible difficulty, carved this line down into the, right into the center of town, and there it stands as a severance, a disconnect between the two halves of the town. The potential of that as a regeneration thing, everybody in the walk was saying, you know, let's make this into a park, let's do it. Let, let's do a bit of car parking in town, let's make it into a park and ride, let's have electric bikes going up and down it, let's do lots and lots of things with this extraordinary legacy that, that we have of this piece of connected space going right out from the harbour all the way up to the edge of town. Next one. Nearly there. Middle of town, choke with cars. What do we do about it, if anything? They'll all be electric, I guess, in the next 10 years or so. Will they still be there? Will we still all own this bunch of real estate, piece of real estate parked in the street? Or will we find some smarter, cleverer way of solving that? I don't know. don't know. 
It's an open question. Everybody commented on it. Everybody, if you, st if you stand there and look, you think, that is just ridiculous, isn't it? What a crazy way to use the, the public space of our city to park cars. Next one. To facilitate circulation. The people in those, uh, in those cars say, well, look, you know, how am I going to get it to work? How am, how am I going to circulate? How am I going to, how am I going to move without, without, without my car? Do we make the city to suit it? Do we re-engineer the city to suit it? That doesn't seem to work. How are we going to get the investment in to uh, encourage the investment in to uh, uh, restore those ra rather beautiful buildings there? Is, does removing the cars help to do that? We don't know. Next one. How we arrive then at the, at the, at the harbour? And then that's when we sat down and we all, we all debated and uh, debated, came up with policies about um, a lot of it was a lot of it was about the ephemeral. Let's improve the ephemeral. Let's stop the littering. Let's tidy things up. Let's clean the place up. A lot of it was about um, um, Im 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 improving circulation for pedestrians, making it easier for the general public to do exactly what we've just done: walking and seeing. As the the origin of the town is about that, it's a walking place, uh, 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 restoring restoring the town to. Uh, for for uh, walking and seeing. There we are. I'm going to finish now. And um, hopefully I've planted a few ideas. The ephemeral and the material is, is, is the big thing. The ephemeral way in which we circulate through a place, economically, socially, environmentally, is the origin of cities anywhere. And how, and we should regard the material city merely as a wrap around the, the, the ephemeral. That's my central thesis. Um, um, so thank you. Well, thank you very much. Julia, some very um, direct triennial themes in there, ephemeral versus material. Um, I think we, what we should do now um, is pass the mic. So if you have any questions, what I'd like to collect maybe three or four questions to sense what's in the room, and then uh, let Steve decide how he's going to manage these questions. What we'd like to achieve is some kind of conversation in the next half hour. So if you bear that in mind, as opposed to kind of one-on-one -on -one discussion. So um, are you there? I can't quite see you. So if you, have, if you put your hand up, you've got a question or a comment. It's very inspirational what you told about, and it's ephemeral, and it's supposed to, to influence what, what happens on material side. And it happened in 2017. Uh, what changes did it bring, and uh, what are the chances we repeat this exercise now for the sake of five years from now? Good idea. Okay. We'll just note it for the moment, if that's okay. Is, okay. Is that all right? Just to get, I so want to get what, a read of who's in the room. What, what happened, and, and what, let's do it again. Yeah, good idea. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for the talk. It was absolutely fantastic, so interesting. Um, I, I wanted to ask whether or not the ephemeral work that happens at the triennial clearly has such an impact on new generation, how much does it influence conversations with people like engineers who potentially may take quite a long time to buy into the proposition of the triennial and how much influence does it have on public planning and the material aspect of the city? So, so planning, engineering, how, how, do we, how do we connect such thinking to the formal process? Yeah, 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 understood. Yeah, great. I can't remember more than three, so... <laughs> we'll, we'll stop at the third one then. We'll go to the third, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd like to thank you for the talk too. It was, it was wonderful. Um, I, I wondered how different it is trying to plan somewhere like Folkestone where there's one whole um, side way out or whatever. Sorry. Um, covered by sea, so you're not coming in and out that way generally. 
I wonder if that made a difference than planning in cities where you've got a whole landscape run on all sides. Right. Well, I'm going to have to answer that one third, so see if, see if I can come up with an answer to that one. Um, right, so the first, first question was about um, um, what, what, changes, what changes occurred and uh, should we do it again? Um, well, um, I, I, I got here a bit earlier. I, I, I don't know if it's my age or something, but I, I seem to want to turn up earlier and earlier to get trains. And I got the one before I was intended to, but anyway. So I got here uh, good and early and had a really good wander around. And last time I was here, uh, the walk across the harbour was still being sandblasted, I think, you know, but now, it, now it's there, you can do it. The, the harbour arm was a sort of a bit of an experiment, and, it, and now it seems to be rather, rather, rather shishy, actually. It's rather, um, uh, you know, rather, rather good. Um, the, the ambitions from three or four years ago about you know, would, would, the, would the town regenerate in terms of shopping? A lot of empty shops, a heck of a lot of empty shops around, and I think many, many more than, than uh, la last time I, I was here. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the pressure, you know, to, to make the, to, to, to have this creative quarter, that, that seems to be enduring, I thought, and, and perhaps, perhaps c uh, catching on more. There seem to be perhaps more shop signs, uh, shop signs. I think the urban room, I think it's terrific, which was in a container at the, at the last time I was here, right on the Harbour Arm, right in the middle of town. I think that's a terrific idea. I have to confess, you know, it was from the Farrell Review, my old boss, good old Terry Farrell. Um, the idea is a place where you come to, to talk about that. I, think, I thought it was, you know, it's one of the better ones I've seen anywhere in the in, anywhere in UK, to be, to be honest. Is it worth doing again? Yes, it is. Absolutely it is. And I'll tell you why that is. The difference between um, a city making and architecture is yeah, there's never a moment where you have a practical completion certificate with a city. With a building, you sign this back. It's practically complete. And from there on, it's decaying into ruin. Um, um, you know, it does get finished, whereas a city never, never, never is finished. It's a continuous process, which is why it's such a wonderful work of art. It's why, the, why I, uh, the, the city is our greatest collective work, work, work of, uh, of crea creativity. So it's never finished. So I think it would be worth doing it. Absolutely, and we should do it. Why, why don't we do that? You know, have, have another set of walks and see what has changed, what hasn't changed. Are things different and what have you? I think some, some of the themes would come up again, probably. Yeah, yeah. Different people, different demographic, you know. I, ideally, the local authority would get one, and that, that sort of links to the next question. But ideally, the local authority should do it. But in, the, in their absence, it, it seems to me that, you know, if, if you think of all the people who make a city, you know, government, investors, developers, constructors, the end users, and the third sector, actually, it's the third sector that's got to do it, because they're the other lot won't do it. They, you know, there's no, an investor, why what, walk around, what for? You know, where's the return on that? You know, government... Well, wh why is the policy that says we're going to walk around? You know, I prob it's probably the third sector. It, it's probably you know from um, a voluntary group or you know uh, you know because uh, you know you know because as a third sector you're not aligned. You know, you haven't got an axe to grind. You're just there to uh, you know try and do good for your, your community and what have you. How do you how do you connect it to the to the to the uh, formal planning process? The planning process is in a state. In my in my in my view, I, um, uh, I have a lot of lot of dear friends who who are planners. They're in local authorities, totally strapped for cash. Uh, no, uh, hardly enough people in the in the room to do it at all. Lumbered with a load of policies which they have to renew every five years. It's always out of date. Da 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 da. -da. It also lacks a coherent coherent theory in my in my view, in that. Um, I mean, the purpose of planning at all is to in intervene in an otherwise completely free market process. But there's no economists there in the planning department. There's no proper analysis of, if we intervene in the market in this way, what are the likely consequences? The damage being done to the poor by very well-meaning um, planning policies, for example, um, let's drive up housing standards. What a good thing to do. Well, eventually there's a budget. Study it wherever you like. 
eventually there's a budget. And the question then is, are you doing the maximum quality for the fewest number of people, or an adequate uh, standard for the maximum number of people? And of course, driving up standards reduces the number of people you can help. So, you know, the, that's just a, a, tr a trivial, rather obvious e example, but so many planning policies are not through, th they're, they're incohate. They're not thought through in terms of who's going to deliver it, who's going to pay for it, what are the consequences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, struck for time, uh, you've got no time, you've got no money, and all, all the rest of it. Um, people default to, well, what's the standard, you know? Traffic engineer, well, I've got 10 minutes, yeah. What's the standard? Well, that's what it is. Rather than having the opportunity to think it, think it through, it, it's a problem. It, it's, it's a real problem about uh, governance. My own view, and again, I don't rule the world, which is a good thing. Uh, but if I did, it would be try and do less. Let's do less planning. Let's not try and control everything. Let's not have stupid politicians standing up and saying, I'm going to make the world beautiful. Really? Really? You're going to do that? Through planning policy? You're going to be mad. Where, where is the, where's the evidence of sound planning to produce any beauty at all? You know, before you start saying, we're going to have a policy. You're going to do beautiful. Really? How are you going to do that then? Kind of, kind of it's a real problem. I, I mean, I think governance in general, you know, why are so many low quality people going into positions of power? Oh, it's because nobody else wants to do it. I'm going to get off on one in a minute, <laughs> aren't I? Which, which, which is not, not, a, not a good thing. And the other, <laughs> so, but let's, but, yeah, yeah, well, there we go. Whether or not they have to be inside the camp, or whether, whether or not it's just, I mean, we live in a democracy, um, uh, well, you know, which, is, which is a fantastic thing. And actually, the planning system, as a, as a formal planning system, it is completely democratic. You know, that the planning officers merely advise that the elected demo, uh, democratically elected people to make the decisions about planning permission or not planning permission. So it seems to me that if, as, uh, as a third sector, um, um, you can come with them good ideas if they, if they can get political traction. Well, that should translate into policy and uh, what have you. But it's about being active citizens, and I think that's where the third sector does come in. You can be a very active citizen and move beyond merely a campaigning organization to actually become a propositional organization. Um, and, you, and you can suggest things which, yeah, yeah. Tell you what, let's do something with the railway line. Let's study it. Let's, let's do it as an art project, um, um, uh, you know, and that, that's that's a way to, that people can then see, oh, you know, well, that's quite a good idea actually. And I think temporary installations is a great way of doing things. I tell you why, you don't need planning permission for them, so you can do them, and after we say that's a damn good idea, and next thing you know, it's written into policy that you've got to do them. Uh, I, I, did, I had a lot of work with the South Bank Centre, which I, I worked on. Um, dealing with the Queen Elizabeth Hall, uh, what, what have you there. And they were terrified of the master plan. And <laughs> not surprisingly, because it's grade one listed, grade two, you know, it's, it's as planning as you can get. I said, well, don't tell them it's permanent. Just tell them it's a work of art that you're doing. And they say, well, can we do that? I said, well, we'll just make a planning application for a temporary thing. Every calms down, it's only temporary, well, what the heck, you know? So we built staircases and installations, big artworks, all the rest of it. And um, got artists to do it for next to nothing. And I remember the director of the South Bank Centre saying to me, he said, do you know, if we try to do this through the planning permission, we'd still be talking to the lawyers and we'd have spent all the money we spent on the artist fee and the installation just on the lawyer's fees to advise us whether or not we could apply for grade one listed consent to do something. So that's the power of it. You can get on and do uh, installations and de demonstration projects which prove the worth of what you're doing and it's popular, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that's what you're doing in Folkestone, it seems to me. These experiments of trying things out, that's the way to do it. So walking and seeing the experimentation, we've got a planning system, haven't we? 
Now the sea. I can rub it all night about this. Uh, uh, what about the sea? Hmm. Well, um, I suppose taking the, taking the very long view, you know, Folkestone is this uh, opportunistic place where a river comes down and creates a connection to the sea, the bounty of the sea, and the harbour builds up around that, and the, shi and the shipping from, from Folkestone comes from that. So in other words, it was, the f it was the sea that created the economy of the place, the ephemeral e economy around which a physical city was built. And that's ended. We're no longer seeing the sea as this source of bounty for the economy of, of the city. So the question is, what is the replacement economy? What is the replacement economy around which we will refurbish, change, add buildings, take buildings away, put public spaces in, da 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 What's the purpose of the sea? For Folkestone, that's a great question. That's a that's a whole that's a that's a festival in itself, isn't it? To to e explore that, there's clearly the fish, isn't there? The fish and the fishing, and you know, rock salt and the fish and chips and uh, 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 and, and shellfish and, and all the rest. So there is a kind of uh, a residual economy about that. Is there some new way in which the the sea could be a source of? Uh, great pride and, and, and uh, economic life for the city? I wonder. I don't know. I don't know. Is it different in different cities? Of course it is, yes. Of course it is. I mean, each city has a, you know, a different reason for, for, for being. But, um, and coastal places, their relationship with the sea is, uh, you know, very particular. It's interesting, you know, like go to somewhere like uh, Whitstable, for example, you know the, the way in which they've they've been cranking up the uh, the, um, the the economy out of their shellfish is is, is extraordinary. Um, a festival of the sea. How do Asset of Folkestone is that seafront bit. You know, yes. Folkestone Harbour going across to the yes. lower Lee's Coastal Park is beautiful. Yes. However, have we blown it? Uh, have we, is this was this an opportunity that um, the planners have blown? I, I know it's difficult because of access down to the seafront. It's difficult. Both access in and, and, and the exit point. Yeah, and yeah. that that that's that's a problem. Yeah, but I am I'm a little bit concerned. I love the Trano and what it brings into folks and you know, the, you know, the, the, the circulation of people, and the ephemeral activities that take place. Folks seem to become alive. When when the Trano's over, it, it, it does dampen down a little bit. It's still a great place to live, um, but it's particularly good whilst the Trano is there. But my concern is that. Um, We've lost an opportunity here with regards to how we could have used better the, the seafront rather than this, this concept. This, this, I think the proposal is for million pound flats, tower block type structures. You know, wh where are we as a local community, where are we going to benefit from that? Yeah, and I don't, and I don't know the answer to it. Uh, I've taken the historical long view, the idea of, of the seafront being a thing of value. Uh, thing to to in, to enjoy. I mean, it's a sort of nineteenth-century uh, in, invention. A, a lot of it done, uh, you know, it, you know, Margate, uh, where they you know invent sea bathing. That was uh, uh, an extraordinary thing. Or you know, the the, the idea of it being a resort. I mean, it comes out of holidays as well. That the working class would go down to the coast and uh, and and enjoy all of that. Um, um, it's a nineteenth-century idea. I guess it got clobbered a lot by sort of cheap travel circulation again. And going off to France and all the rest of it, uh, possibly coming back. You know, uh, you know, again, you know, the, the effort that's going in, you know, um, 
uh, Margate, Folkestone, Hastings, Whitstable, da 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 da, to, to, uh, to, to try and find some new relevance for seafront activity. Uh, I don't. I, the, apart, the apartment blocks? Don't know. Can I ask a, a question there? I have an interest in the question, but um, if, we, if we go back to the seaside and then the land side of Folkestone, it begs the question what's going on at the edge here? And in one of your slides, it seemed to me, I think you said, there's an area which I think you called the center, which is the car park down by the seaside, but I think you called it the center. And if I see it as a center, it was very, very empty. And one of the links to circulation and one of the thoughts about circulation is the heart in the center of all this circulation of yeah. the blood. Yeah. And it seems to me energetically or in terms of the blockages and so on, it's screaming out from that slide, um, this space, whether it's the center or not, this is the kind of heart of Folkestone, of all its circulation. Yeah. And yeah. It's, it seems to me that somehow is the key to the, the link between the land side and the seaside. What's, what's interesting is, if you, read, if you read people like Peter Ackroyd, I mean, his, his, his wonderful uh, uh, biography of London, it's how long, how long um, stresses or strains in an urban environment continue. I'm, I'm, writing, I'm doing a piece of writing at the moment about uh, Old Street Roundabout, which is near, near where, I, where I live. Abercrombie, complete lunatic, uh, decides to build a, fl a, a flyover in 1945. He's going to go out to the east. Fantastic. Blighted the whole of Hackney and, and, and all the rest of it. That idea, 1945, we're still trying to recover from it. 70 years later, we're still trying to recover from it. Knocking things down, rearranging traffic, changing the tube station, spending 30 million quid, da 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 so the reason why the <laughs> there's a car park and all the rest of it, yeah, it's a kind of um, it's a kind of reverberation of, of Big Bang when when the harbour was a very industrial place, and of course it no longer is. But these things can these the, these memories of uh, past stresses and strains, they kind of keep echoing da down the years until somebody comes up with an alternative. Forgive the plug for the name of the company, somebody comes up with a different urban narrative. Uh, uh, you know, uh, tell it, start telling a different story about it. No, 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 it's not about, it's not about a lorry park and uh, loading onto ships and all the rest of it. It's a different thing. If you had a different vocabulary to talk about it, of course you'd say, well, <laughs> and, and the debate about centres, you can get into some, you know, sit, uh, you know, um, where, where's, where's, the middle, where's the middle of, it, uh, of things? It, it's a very relative. It's a very postmodern thing because you, you know it depends where you start from. You know, it's, it's a bit like the uh, the old joke about you know. Can you tell me how I get to the station? And it, the answer is, well, I wouldn't start from here. You know, it's it's one of those sort of uh, uh, you know something other than the word centre. I think would 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 help to give that 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 uh, place. Hang on, can you wait for the mic? A city or a town um, that doesn't have a sea on one edge, then it seems to me that you're looking in to a centre. Whereas if you've got a sea, it seems like the whole town is, or city is looking out. Yes. Um, so it is hard, I think, to... Yeah, they're, uh, they're economically much, much more difficult. You know, a, you know, a nice flat plain you know, with, a, with a radial city coming to the middle is a lot easier thing to manage than a half a city one half of which is is water. That that's for sure, you know, because you've got bigger catchment of people. There's more more people can get to more uh, central locations to do uh, the things they want to do. Yes, yeah, so you're, you're absolutely right. It is it is hard 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 to manage, particularly if the you know the the industrial beating heart of the of the thing, the harbour, the fishing fleet, and all the rest of it, is no longer the force that it once was. For the view. For the view. Mm -hmm. yeah. I can see a couple of questions. Is there one at the back as well? Was it, did I see you right? Okay. This lady um, here. You talked about uh, Folkestone being unusual, that um, deprivation was on the centre and wealth was towards the outside. It's not um, unique, but it's... Yeah. We are from Morecambe and it's the same. Um, deprivation in the centre. Yep. Is that something that is typical of coastal towns? Is it 
coincidence that we recognise that in a, another coastal place in the north? It'll, it'll be the result of the same. Of, uh, Morecambe's different, uh, you know, fine, fine place. Rather a posh part of Blackpool, I always thought. <laughs> but uh, 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 <laughs> perhaps I'm wrong. Um, well, th these places were very, very, very popular. For, you know, the late 19th century, tw early 20th century. You know, the, the the mills would shut, and everybody went down to uh, to, to the coast. And you know, Blackpool used to, used to boom. You know, but it's a pretty sad place now. I mean, when the Labour Party won't even go there for a conference, you know, you're in trouble. You know what I mean? Because um, uh, because <laughs> even the Labour politicians are saying that the accommodation is dreadful. <laughs> you know. Well, that's 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 a, that's a uh, but it's economics, isn't it? The, the economics of the, the the reason for being of the place has has has, has gone, and that applies to very very many uh, places that that uh, prospered out of the the holiday, uh, the, the English seaside holiday thing, and that needs reinventing, and it has been reinvented, I think. Covid's probably yeah. helped. Yeah. yeah. Good old Morecambe, eh? It's a long way to come for a talk. Very kind of you. Oh, there we are, there we are. I thought I heard a good northern accent. Excellent, <laughs> well done. Are we about done? Don't you all want to get to the pub now? Uh, no, I have a question. Oh. Um, an, an observation, really. As an economist, I think one way you can look at Folkestone uh, is in terms of the so-called experiential economy, meaning people have, believe it or not, so much disposable income, they can come out for the day and look out to sea and go home. And, uh, and I think it's a really important part of modern economics. The, the people have an experience and they fund that experience. And I think one of the interesting things about the current triennial and also your five walks, I'm sure Lewis Biggs has this in mind, <laughs> um, the current triennial is really interesting. It's based on five walks. And when people come and it, I run the urban room and when they come for the guidebook, I always say, here's the map of Folkestone. And be careful, because when you walk around Folkestone, you will see 74 artworks. Or you can walk around Folkestone, look at its artworks, and you'll see all of Folkestone. Because the routes take you on the walking routes, up and down the medieval steps. They don't follow the traffic routes. And I think that's part of the experiential economy. People will come here just to do that. And then the economy, the so-called material economy, accommodates. But the crucial thing is people can afford to come just to have the experience. And here I think it's critical that the experience they would get is the walking and seeing Folkestone. And you just hear them ticking, it just ticks such a huge box. And then they go back to London or wherever they come from. Um, so I, this is kind of observation on my part, but I think it's very, for me, folks in that sense is a world example of a much wider problem. How do you accommodate this experiential economy? Yeah, uh, well, um, I agree with you. But I think it's a bit brittle as an, as an economic idea, if I might say so, to a, a Go ahead. St esteemed economist, <laughs> so, um, as, a, um, as a mere architect. Uh, it's a bit brittle, isn't it? You, know, you, you, you could end up that that particular experiential economy uh, falls away. It seems to me that uh, plurality is a, is a much better basis for, for, an, for an economy. Because if one of them goes down, you've got the other one that you can, you can, you can build up. And it seems to me that... Uh, that creativity, the idea of bringing people together for creative means is something everybody's after in the world. We have to be much more creative about the environment, about engineering, about design, about architecture, about how we live as a society, how we grow our food, etc. Et we need a lot of, uh, the one thing we're really short of in the world is creativity. And it seems to me that if that's the, the core of your, uh, your um, economic idea, the ephemeral idea, which is you know, the creativity of the festival, that, I think you can build, build on that. I mean, if, 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 if I saw in the paper tomorrow, um, uh, Folkestone Art College just opened. I think, oh, that's pretty obvious. Or uh, Folkestone School of Creativity opened. Well, that flows absolutely naturally out of what, 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 you're, what you're already doing. You could, you could well imagine that happening and this being a big art college and loads of students coming down here and blah, blah, blah. building an economy around the experiential economy, but the creative economy, 
um, the discussion economy. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that, that one needs to be uh, d do, doing more, more, more of that. And it seems to me that Folkestone has a particular role in, in the London regional economy, which is more than just, you know, a bit of a Saturday out, you know? But then again, I don't rule the world. Although perhaps I should. Okay. I, um, are there any further comments, questions? Um, if not, I'd, I'd like to thank you for this kind of unintended masterclass because I think it's been a great focus on Folkestone. And um, so thank you very much. Yes. Yep. words in um, conclusion. Um, <coughs> do I sit here? Or sit, or well, yes, please. definitely. Yeah. <coughs> um, you don't want to sing when you sit on one of these things. <laughs> please please <Queen>. don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dave Allen. Oh. Dave Allen. <laughs> so I wanted to um, pay tribute to um, Steve and John, uh, the, the John Revel and Steve Smith because I, have, I learned a lot from talking, and in particular from walking and talking. Those, those, uh, the, those five walks that we did and the, the documentation of them are available online now. You can find them uh, in the Urban Room, um, on the, from the Urban Room website, or you can get there through the <coughs> Creative Folkestone Triennial uh, website via via the urban room as an, as an artwork from the 2017 triennial but um <coughs> the my initial idea for this triennial uh, called the plot my initial working title was walking and talking because i do think that that uh, the experience of walking and talking as, as we've just been talking about is very powerful. It's a very powerful um, thing to do with other people. It's a social, a social thing to do, and it's a highly constructive and creative thing to do. And I, I, I think I, I maybe maybe I misunderstood what you said, Steve. But I th uh, uh, creativity is abundant. Everybody is creative. Everybody in the world is creative. There's n there's no lack of creativity. What there is a lack of is the permission to use your creativity. Better put. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can agree on that. Good. <laughs> um, <coughs> so um, walking and talking might have got us to exactly the same place, but 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 as, as um, Steve so beautifully um, illustrated, the there are. There, are, there is an ephemeral part of culture and there is a more material part of culture. And the way in which those two things interact is exactly what I was trying to get people to think about by using the word, the plot, uh, the title, the plot, um, which is both a narrative or a conspiracy and also a physical thing. So th thanks, Steve, for a great talk. And, I, and now I want to thank uh, Christopher Houghton Budd for... Um, dreaming up this series of three talks, which this is the last, on the, on the subject of circulation. And, um, and the th all three speakers have been wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher was the middle speaker. And, um, and I do think that the, the circulation, the idea of circulation, the concept of circulation is fundamental both to um, both to the plot as an exhibition, but uh, much more importantly, it is fundamental to the idea of making place and the creative thing that a city is. So thank you for the three talks, Christopher, and uh, you will be able to see them online through YouTube. Yeah, I think the trainer has its own YouTube channel, so you can go there and probably in half an hour it's already up there, yeah. um, unpeer reviewed. <laughs> um, and could I just add with my motto, there was a discussion about engineers, and uh, my motto is, do you ask for forgiveness and not permission? And this will take you a very long way.
So that would be my answer, lady. Ask for forgiveness and not permission. Forgiveness of what you just did, not for permission for what you're going to do. Or those that say, just do it. Anyway, thank you very thank much you. for coming. Please, yeah. <clears throat>